This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Well, welcome everyone to episode 90 of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Mike Morrison, and with me, as he always is, is Zachary Fruling. Today, Zachary and I are going to be doing a philosophical deconstruct of the Q continuum. Sort of an analysis, if you will. Zachary, how are you doing today? Mike, I'm so glad we're getting a chance to record Metatrex more often these days. It, it had been a while. There was a period of time where we couldn't record for two or three months, and we're getting back to a regular recording rhythm. So expect more episodes of Metatrex coming soon. Yes. But I'm excited to talk about the Q continuum. You and I have talked about doing a philosophical analysis of the Q for some time, and I'm excited to do that today. Yeah, I... I Extended an invitation to Quinn. Everybody knows that Quinn is a respected philosopher in the continuum, but uh, I didn't get a response back. I'm, I'm not sure what to make of that. Well, it's entirely possible that Quinn was held up being imprisoned in a rogue comet, so he had to miss the show tonight. That's entirely possible. This is going to be really interesting because this is kind of a, a, a mashup of of theology and philosophy. This is definitely in our wheelhouse, and I'm not exactly sure, Zachary, why we haven't tackled this topic before, but there's plenty of content here for us to dive into. Well, this is one of those areas where philosophy and theology overlap, right? What we're going to do is to give a philosophical analysis of the Q. I think as if the Q were deities, and I think that's an interesting question right off the bat, is should we consider the Q to be a deity of some sort? They seem to have a lot of the properties that deities have, at least in the Judeo-Christian sense. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, all of the omnis, right? And the Q seem to have some of those. Maybe not omnibenevolence. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> I don't know if you know what to call Q omnibenevolence. <laughs> I was, going, to, I was have, going to make that point. I, I don't think that they are omnibenevolent. <laughs> but they seem to have a lot of the omnis, and that makes them deity-like. So I think right off the bat, we need to think, should we think of the Q as deities? And if so, let's give an analysis of the concepts that we usually associate with deities. All of the omnis, including some other concepts like transcendence and imminence and immortality. So I'm looking forward to seeing what sense we can make both of the Q as deities, but also diving in to talk about some of the attributes of the Q continuum, all of these omnis, omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence, and giving a philosophical analysis of those concepts through the lens of the Q continuum. We've got about 12 episodes within the canon of Star Trek to pull from as we have this discussion. And if we want to really just kind of get creative and throw it in there, I I really consider Trelane from the original series episode Squire of Gothos to be a member of the Q Continuum as well. So it's 12 episodes plus one is what 12 you're saying. 12 plus one, yes. I, I think so. That's, that's I, my humble opinion. And Zachary, those 12 episodes from The Next Generation, there are eight episodes. Season one, Encounter of Farpoint, Hide and Q from season two, Q Who. Season three, Deja Q. Season 4, Cupid, True Q from Season 6, as well as Tapestry, and Season 7, All Good Things. DS9 gave us only one Lily Q episode, that was Q-less in Season 1. And then Voyager, of course, we have three, uh, what I believe are, are really epic, defining Q episodes, Death Wish, The Q and the Gray from Season 3, and Season 7's Q2. 
I just want to encourage our listeners to do a Q rewatch sometime. That might be fun to uh, just sit down and kind of do a binge of these great Q episodes, all 12 of them from Next Generation, DS9, and Voyager. I'm actually surprised it's only 12 episodes. I never took the time to count the Q episodes. Uh, I'm glad you took the time to do that before we started recording. Once in a while, we get new listeners of Metatrex that are not hardcore Star Trek fans. Maybe they're philosophers and they're interested in Star Trek and philosophy for one reason or another. How would you describe the Q continuum or the Q as a race of beings to a non-Star Trek fan? When describing the Q continuum, I typically use the descriptors godlike and transcendent. I find it difficult to to explain the Q in any kind of broad terms because uh, each of the episodes that we're kind of going to explore, not piece by piece, we're not going to sit and dissect them episode by episode, but as, as we consider all of these 12 episodes plus the one, it's it's difficult because each time we get a different slice of, of the queue, and I suspect that there's a great deal more to be discovered. They also have a bit of a superiority complex. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And the queue that we see on screen, even though they're not strictly speaking humanoids, they can take humanoid form, and they pop into being present, like they flash and they're there and they can flash and disappear and be somewhere else if they want to be. And that's one of their defining characteristics that makes them so annoying. Like Q will show up, he'll flash into into being present, do something annoying, flash, go somewhere else, do something else annoying. And you never know when the Q are going to show up. So this sort of popping in, not popping in and out of existence, but popping in and out of taking humanoid form and being present with a, you know, very dramatic flash and a flash as they leave is how the Q manifest when they when they uh, appear on screen in Star Trek. Well, and I think that's the the appropriate term manifest. Uh, We're at least given the impression that they are always there. They are omnipresent. Uh, they, They are always in our space. They're just not visible. They're not discernible. They're not detectable. And then poof, you know, with a flash of light, uh, Q manifests himself and usually uh, shenanigans follow. If anyone does shenanigans in Star Trek, it's the Q. It is the Q. And we should distinguish. There are There is the Q continuum, which is I'm a little confused about this, actually, Mike. Maybe you can help me understand the Q, the Q continuum right off the bat. Is the Q continuum the sum total of all the different Q together, or is the Q continuum a realm where these different Q tend to inhabit? That's a great question. Uh, and, and I get this kind of in theological circles quite a bit, because in Christian theology, we refer to God as a trinity. Uh, and that is to say that God is God the Father— God is God the Son, but God is also the Holy Spirit. And so you have these three distinguishable beings, but all three of them are God. And I'm not going to unpack that just yet. I I think we'll probably get to it a little bit later. But I, I think of the Q continuum in a very similar way. I think each each Q is certainly distinguishable and separate, and yet all of them together are the sum total of the continuum. Uh, we see within uh, these 12 episodes of Star Trek, we see, of course, the, the John Delancey Q character that most of us think of when we talk about the Q, but we also have Quinn. We also have the Q character played by actor Corbin Burnson. We have the female Q that we were introduced to in Star Trek Voyager, as well as some other Q characters within the realm of that wonderful episode, the Q and the Gray from the third season. And then, of course, we get Q Jr. uh, towards the end in season seven. I have to admit, Mike, that I never thought of the Q as co-constitutive of the Q continuum. Basically, we have two different ways we can think of what the Q continuum is. Is the Q continuum a separate realm that the Q inhabit, like a separate dimension? That's how I had always envisioned it. I never pictured the Q as being the separate Q, the individual Q beings as being linked together in any way. I envisioned them as separate, you know, 
uh, godlike beings that all have omnipotence and omnipresence and some of these other qualities that we're going to deconstruct here in a little bit. But not that they made up the Q continuum, but the Q continuum was where they resided when they weren't taking humanoid form here in the here in the physical world. So that's one way to look at the Q continuum. But you're describing another way of looking at the Q continuum, which is thinking of the separate godlike Q beings as being co-constituents of the Q continuum as a whole. Uh, the analogy of the Trinity is an interesting one, you know, having three persons or three beings in one. There's a paradoxical element of that that we try to wrap our brains around. But does that make sense to, to think of the Q that way? Um, you know, is there this one thing, the Q continuum, that has different manifestations in in these seemingly separate Q entities? It's interesting because Voyager gave us a a visual of the Q continuum. If you recall, it was kind of this deserted town out in the middle of nowhere. They're on a a, a you know kind of a an old road, and it's, it's flat, and there's desert, and and everything's brown visually. It's you know it's very very much deserted, and the buildings are dilapidated, and 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 we're told that this is the continuum, uh, but in reality, it was the continuum as it was perceived by the crew of Voyager. It was symbolic of the condition that the continuum is. And so theology in many ways, because after all, we're presented these characters and we're told that they are godlike or they at least possess uh, a lot of the attributes and characteristics of what we would consider uh, the Judeo-Christian God. And so much of that informs my perception of how I see the continuum. And so if if the continuum is indeed omnipresent, it's something more akin to what George Lucas gave us in the Force in Star Wars. We're told that the Force is everywhere. It's the stuff that binds the universe together, and it flows in and through. And and I see God, the Judeo-Christian God, very much that way. Uh, God is omnipresent. When we talk about God, in theology, we talk about heaven, or we talk about uh, the human heart. We have this analogy in the Christian church. We say that Jesus lives in our heart. Well, that's that's a strange concept for some people when you take a physical being, Jesus, who manifested himself in the Christian Bible as a human being. And as John tells us in John's gospel, uh, he walked among us and he said, and we beheld his glory, uh, even as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so we think about Jesus in a physical form, and yet we spiritualize him and we say that he lives in our blood pumping muscle. And so that's a strange concept for many people. But in reality, God is God is a spirit, an omnipresent spirit that uh, very very much the way George Lucas's force permeates everything, so does God. And so when I see the the Q continuum within Star Trek, I think of it very much in in terms of being omnipresent, always there, and only manifesting himself when it suits his fancy. We'll get back to talking about the Q in just a moment, but even in Judeo-Christian theology, there's a tension between thinking of God as omnipresent or imminent in in the physical world, being everywhere around us in everything, right? In the mm-hmm. tree, in me, sure. in, down, down, in your neighbor down the street, right? Uh, on the other side of the universe, everywhere, literally omnipresent, everywhere, right? Yes. And thinking of God as transcendent, right? If God is also separate from the universe, as a creator of the universe— God can't be merely omnipresent. He also has to be transcendent in some way, Certainly. you know, above and beyond the universe. So how you reconcile this notion of God as transcendent in the role uh, as a creator of the universe and imminent in creation, imminent in everything in the physical world is, is not an easy um, uh, conceptual tension to recognize even in Christian theology. I mean, these are terms that everyone knows and uses that God is transcendent and also God is imminent in creation. But what it, what exactly it means to be both transcendent and imminent at the same time is not easy to figure out conceptually at all. No, and it's certainly 
it's certainly a hot button topic among theologians, and you're absolutely right. There, there is a tremendous tension that exists. In Christian theology, we talk about the eminence of God. It refers to him being in the world. Uh, it's contrasted with transcendence, but Christian theologians usually emphasize that the two attributes are not contradictory, although they seem to be. Uh, they hold to transcendence, but not to eminence, and that's what we call deism. While to hold to eminence but not transcendence, that's pantheism. There's also an interesting middle position that, I, that I'm aware of called panentheism. Yes. The notion that God is somehow more than creation but still eminent in creation. You can almost think of it like, like two circles, one inside of the other. If the inner circle is the entire physical universe and the outer circle is God, then God is everywhere inside the inner circle, but still mm -hmm. somehow more than the inner circle. So these kind of spatial metaphors can be useful for understanding how this middle position panentheism works. But you're right that theologians tend to err on one or the other side of the spectrum. You know, if you emphasize transcendence, you tend to be more of a deist. If you, mm -hmm. if you emphasize imminence, you tend to be more of a pantheist, thinking that God is everywhere, but somehow, somehow identical with creation. Like Spinoza was a pantheist. He thought that yes. God was basically everything in nature and and he, and he de-emphasized the transcendence aspect of, of God. How do we relate this to the Q? Um, it's interesting to think of the Q as sustaining reality. And one of the things that God's eminence does in Judeo-Christian theology is sustain reality. If God is everywhere, then God is helping sustain the existence of everything. If God were gone, then poof, the universe would go along with it. Exactly. Because God isn't sustaining the existence of the universe anymore. So I hadn't really thought of the Q continuum as serving that sustaining role um, that God's omnipresence is supposed to serve in, in Judeo-Christian theology. It's an interesting way to think about the Q continuum, that the Q continuum is more like the force binding everything together, <laughs> sustain, <laughs> not even binding everything together, more sustaining the existence of things. That's how I tend to think of, of God's imminence and, and uh, omnipresence in Judeo-Christian theology, sustaining reality, not necessarily binding things together in, in some spooky sense, but providing a reason for the continued existence of reality in general. Yeah, well said. The contemporary theologian Wayne Grudem said that the God of the Bible isn't really an abstract concept. He's not an abstract deity uh, removed from and uninterested in creation. But rather, he said that the Bible is really the story of God's involvement in his creation. So, so there, there is that sustainability. It's, it, it's, it really is a story from, from the concept of time and space and earth and that we get in Genesis, that story of beginnings, uh, all the way through to the redemption of man's fall. And even when we get to the prophetic books of the Bible, both Old Testament, New Testament, Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation are typically the books that we think of. We see God's involvement even in these future events and, and ultimately the trajectory for which uh, time and space and, and mankind and planet Earth is heading on. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this because I want to bring this back to Star Trek, Certainly. but there is an interesting tension in thinking of God as being transcendent, separate from creation, separate from reality, but also being so active in creation as to do things like working miracles, mm -hmm. right? It's almost like Christian believers want to have it both ways. They want a God that's radically separate, radically transcendent mm -hmm. as a creator, but also a God that's active in reality. You can't think of God as totally separate, otherwise there'd be no interaction in the world. There wouldn't be things like miracles that, that Christians believe in. So, um, And we have the same problem with the Q. If the Q are transcendent, which it seems like they are, they seem to be separate from the physical universe. They can pop in and out of the physical universe in some in some way. But they also have to be deeply immersed in the physical universe to be able to pop in and out of existence anywhere they want, to be able to affect things in the physical universe, to be able to manifest and take physical form. So how you reconcile this radical transcendence that they seem to have with their ability to be omnipresent where, or with their ability to manifest as a physical being anywhere they want in the physical universe and just how you reconcile those two concepts I think isn't clear at all. Uh, again, in Christian theology, there's this interesting position, panentheism, mm -hmm. <laughs> which which seems to give some way of making making sense, thinking of God as 
more than creation, but still somehow in, in creation, um, that almost like the physical world is a subset of God in some way, as if you were going to draw this like a, like a, a Venn diagram with one circle entirely right. inside the other. I'm not sure that makes sense with the Q, though. Does it make sense to think of the Q as being somehow more than, than creation and, and also that, that all the physical world is a subset of the Q continuum? I, that doesn't sound right to me when I, when I think of the Q continuum as we see it on screen, but it might be a way of making sense of the Q continuum. Possibly. And I, I see some, and I don't want to get off topic and, and begin a kind of an exploration of the wormhole aliens to prophets from Deep Space Nine. But I think there's an interesting contrast even within Star Trek, and that is to contrast the Q continuum and the wormhole aliens that are very much transcendent. They don't seem to uh, desire any involvement, even uh, to a great degree, fail in their understanding of the physical realm and the experience of linear time. And so, so I think there's an interesting contrast there uh, to be made as well. And I think, I, I think that contrast is just as interesting as the contrast between the continuum and the Judeo Christian God. Are you saying that the wormhole aliens in deep space nine, the prophets that they have transcendence, but not imminence. The, they seem to have Q, the Q and the wormhole aliens seem to both be transcendent, right? They're not mm-hmm. part of the physical universe. They, they're above and beyond it in some way. But the Q seem to have omnipresence in a way that the wormhole aliens don't seem to be able to. I don't think of the wormhole aliens as being able to manifest themselves wherever they want in the physical universe. They seem confined to the wormhole in some way. Or maybe through the orbs, maybe there's a, and maybe the orbs mediate in some way, but they they don't seem to be able to manifest like the Q continuum. To me, I see them as content in, in the wormhole. I hmm. and perhaps I'm reading into it, and maybe I'm seeing the wormhole aliens through a, a theological lens. But I, I see them as being more content. Uh, certainly, they have some ability to manifest themselves and to even pull uh, people and things out of reality. I, I, I find that fascinating. Uh, we have a character within Deep Space Nine uh, who disappeared from history and then poof, reappears uh, just in time to declare himself the, uh, the emissary of the prophets. Oh, like, like Elijah. Like Elijah, absolutely. <laughs> Off in a fiery chariot, and then suddenly reappears. Uh, you know, and, and that, that's an interesting reference to Christian eschatology. You know, Elijah in the Christian Bible in the Old Testament is taken away in a fiery chariot. He disappears. He doesn't die, and we see in eschatological studies in the New Testament in Revelation. Elijah reappears at the end of days to to proclaim uh, the coming of the kingdom, and so I, I think I think that's a really interesting uh, thing that uh, you mentioned there. That just uh, from from Deep Space Nine, maybe that's a topic for another show. Well, we've I mentioned thought, I hadn't thought about that till you mentioned it. <laughs> well, we've mentioned a couple of these omnis already omnipresence and such. I want to go through these one by one and see if they make sense as applied to the Q continuum, because I think some of them make sense in terms of the Q and some of them don't. Let's talk about omnipresence. That's one we've mentioned already. Are the Q genuinely omnipresent? Certainly the Q have the ability to manifest themselves in humanoid form or any other form they want for that matter at a particular location in space-time. They can manifest themselves anywhere they want in the physical universe. But the fact that they can manifest themselves anywhere they want in the physical universe, does that make them omnipresent? Does that make them occupying every point in the universe simultaneously? Well, I think that we're given at least the impression within Star Trek that they do. I think that uh, certainly from the very first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, we get the idea that they are always watching. Uh, they are omnipresent and always there, always watching. Mankind is always being observed. And as strange and creepy as that sounds, that really is uh, probably man's best attempt at making sense of what it means 
for a being to be omnipresent. Okay, that's an interesting take on things. I had thought of it a little bit differently. I had thought of it as the cue being able to manifest themselves in a particular point in space-time and then Mm -hmm. being able to pop out of space-time and manifest themselves at a different point in space-time whenever they want. But the fact that they can observe all of the physical universe at the same time, I don't think requires being physically present in the physical universe at the same time. We did a previous episode of Metatrex on dimensions. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible that you can think of the Q continuum as being in a a higher dimension, a a separate realm than the physical universe. Maybe looking at the the physical universe as a whole, but not not necessarily being within the physical universe as a whole, right? It's possible to... um, Think of the Q continuum as being in the fourth dimension, if that makes sense, right? You have the three spatial dimensions, and the Q continuum is the fourth dimension. Right. If you're looking at the entire space-time continuum from this fourth dimension, from the Q continuum, you can see all of space-time laid out in front of you without necessarily being within that space-time. And certainly the Q can manifest themselves, but I never thought of the Q as being omnipresent, as in literally occupying every point in space-time simultaneously, even though they can observe all of space-time as a whole. I think we are given the impression within Star Trek that they can very much do that. Um, they do have the ability to manifest themselves at different points in in time and space time, and and I I do see that as an attribute that the writers that Star Trek wants to be attributed to to the Q. I guess I just see a slight conceptual difference between being able to manifest in a particular point in space time on command, you know, wherever you want to be, and literally taking up every point in space time at the same time. So, so I don't see the cue as being omnipresent in that sense. And interesting, you see it, you see it a little differently. You see them as being omnipresent. That that's a necessary condition for being able to manifest at any point in space time. I see them as being somehow more transcendent and separate from space time and sort of selectively popping into space time, but not taking up all of space time simultaneously. But yet at the same time, they're occupying their own realm in the queue and the gray, and they're having a a civil war that at least seems to have ramifications on the physical world. Yeah, on a universal scale, literally. Without a doubt. So I, th- I think Q in the gray makes my point that they are truly omnipresent. Yeah, in the Q in the gray, there seems to be a danger that if the civil war progresses too far, that the very fabric of space-time will somehow unravel here mm-hmm. in the physical world. Does that mean that the Q are, om- are omnipresent? Do they have that radical imminence in the way that the Judeo-Christian God has in terms of being imminent or or omnipresent? I think it's arguable, to say the least. So what about omnipotence, Zachary? I think if there's any one of the omnis that the Q plausibly have, it's omnipotence, right? This is their thing. This is Q's thing. I'm omnipotent again. (laughs) (laughs) This is Q's bag. (laughs) So, But we need to deconstruct it. Are the Q genuinely omnipotent? There are these paradoxes of omnipotence, right? Can God create a stone so heavy he can't lift it? That kind of thing. And certainly we get some of that in Star Trek. We mentioned Quinn earlier, right? Can the Q create a prison so powerful that even another Q can't break out of the prison? That's pretty much what we see inside the episode Death Wish from Voyager. We have a Q imprisoned inside what's essentially a prison created by another Q or by the Q continuum as a whole. If Quinn is supposed to be omnipotent, how come he can't break out of this prison, right? These paradoxes of omnipotence are supposed to undermine the notion of omnipotence to some degree, showing that the concept of omnipotence is somehow self-contradictory, right? If you literally are all-powerful, you can do anything, then you should be able to create a stone so great you can't lift it, right? Because that's part of being able to do everything. (laughs) But if you're omnipotent, you should be able to move the the, the stone. Um, So Quinn, being omnipotent, should be able to break out of this Q-created prison if he's genuinely omnipotent. So one question, are the Q genuinely omnipotent? And two, is the notion of omnipotence self-contradictory? Does it even, is it even a coherent notion? C.S. Lewis clarifies the concept of omnipotence by saying his omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. You may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. And only C.S. Lewis could make a statement like that. And he says, this is not a limit to his power. 
You could characterize it in terms of having the ability to do all things that are logically possible, that are not internally consistent. So, Mm -hmm. you know, God couldn't make two plus two equals five, right? That's an internally inconsistent notion. And likewise, the Q couldn't do that kind of thing either. It's not a logically possible thing to have happen. And so it's not part of omnipotence. Exactly. And when Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, with God, all things are possible. All the things that are logically possible. All the things that are logic. Exactly. All the things that are logically <laughs> possible. Uh, I, I think, can, can God create a prison so strong that he can't break out? Well, if God is truly omnipotent, as Jesus says that he is, in, in the Old Testament, we have this name for God, Al Shaddai. That title literally means God the Father Almighty. And so we attribute this this attribute of, of omnipotence to, to God. And when we think of a God in any form, in literature, in film, in Star Trek, we, this is almost like one of the most basic litmus tests for God. Is he or she omnipotent? We get this in Star Trek The Next Generation with the character Ardra in the episode Devil's Do. That was the litmus test. You know, is she omnipotent? Well, she certainly seemed to be. So, okay, what is the source of the... If we can debunk her omnipotence, then we can debunk her claim to be a deity. But the Q seem to have genuine omnipotence. I think of all the omnis that they have, they do seem to be omnipotent in a way that Ardra was was an imposter in Devil's Due. I think I think they certainly do, uh, and I think you're right. This is this is Q shtick. So I think we can attribute omnipotence to the Q, and I think nothing demonstrates that better than the fact that they do the completely ridiculous and construct a prison for one of their own. These logical paradoxes aside, creating a prison so strong another Q can't break out of it and such. I love that, by the way. Logically impossible things aside. Are there things that the Q can't do? Are there any counterexamples to their being omnipotent? Well, we certainly see that they can lose their omnipotence. That seems to be a punishment for uh, at least what the Q consider ill behavior. This is interesting. It's almost like there's a difference between the omnipotence that an individual Q has and the superior omnipotence, if that makes any sense whatsoever, of the Q continuum. Like the, Q, the the omnipotence of the Q continuum outranks the omnipotence of an individual Q. The Q continuum can create a prison so strong an individual Q can't break out of it, even though the individual Q is omnipotent. Is the power of the Q additive in that way? Or two Qs better than one? <laughs> because it seems like the collective power of the Q continuum outranks the individual omnipotence of an individual Q. The Q continuum can punish a Q by taking away its omnipotence, whereas any other omnipotent being couldn't do that. It's the Q continuum as a whole, writ large, seems to have that greater sense of omnipotence. Are there levels of omnipotence just like there are levels of infinity mathematically? Zachary, this takes me back to... The Q and the gray, because one of the things that I always found interesting was that in the episode Death Wish from the second season of Voyager, we have Quinn who wants to commit suicide. He wants to cease to exist. He, he no longer desires to live. And, 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 and tragically, at the end of the episode, he does take his own life. And John Delancey Q says that this is going to have, you know, ramifications in, in the Q continuum. There are going to be consequences for what has taken place because at the beginning of the episode, it was a ridiculous thought that a Q could die, much less commit suicide. And so we come to the third season, the Q and the Gray, and they're in a state of civil war and Q are dying. They are they are literally killing one another. And it's having, as we've already mentioned, these kind of universal consequences. Well, this seems like an interesting variant on the on the paradoxes of omnipotence. Is there a paradox of immortality? Does it make sense for an immortal being to commit suicide? It, it seems rather ridiculous, frankly, uh, to think that an immortal would not desire immortality. Was well, it even possible I mean, if an immortal being can commit suicide, maybe they just weren't an immortal being. 
Well, certainly I think that's that's a fair conclusion because then we go back to the idea of an immortal being, or in this case, the Q continuum, or we can attribute this to the Judeo-Christian God. Or if if they if they can die, if they can commit suicide, are they really omnipresent? I guess I want to debunk the Q continuum, the myth of the Q. Right, line by line, I'm like, they're not really omnipotent. They're not really immortal. Look, <laughs> they can't be deities. No. Well, I think it can be argued that they're not immortal because certainly we see that they can die. Well, let's keep going down the list. How about omniscience being all-knowing? Do the Q literally know everything that there is to know? They certainly seem to. I think we have evidence that they do. I think we see that in no better way than the season seven final episode of TNG, All Good Things. They can certainly see the connectivity of events through time. That's pretty all-knowing. That seems to me like they would be omniscient. Zachary, really the only example that I can think of, and and it's a very loose example, in the episode Q2 from Season 7 of Voyager, it seems to me that Q was lacking in his knowledge of the trajectory for which Junior was going on. There seemed to be a lot of uncertainty there. I know that's a loose example, but it's really the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Well, even though we have the term omniscience, it's important to give an analysis of that concept. What does that mean? One way of characterizing what omniscience means is to think of it in terms of knowing all things that are true, knowing all true propositions or all true statements. Do members of the Q continuum know every true statement that there is? Like, for example, can they can they read minds? You know, there are true things about what Captain Picard thinks, right? Captain Picard feels mm-hmm. certain things, has certain intentions. Those are true. They're part of reality. Does Q know those kinds of things about Captain Picard's thoughts or feelings? I don't get that sense from watching the Q episodes in TNG, at least. He doesn't seem to be able to read Captain Picard's mind, so there are some things he doesn't know. Did I just come up with the disproof of the omniscience of the Q? I think you did, Zachary, because as you're as you're saying these things, I, I, I think there's a lot of truth there. The theologian Louis Burkhoff regards the wisdom of God as a, quote, particular aspect of his knowledge. So... In Romans chapter 16, when the Christian Bible speaks about the only wise God in reference to the Judeo-Christian God, we understand that God's wisdom flows from that particular aspect of absolute and total knowledge. I don't see that as being something that is true of the Q Continuum. I'm trying to think of different things that are not captured by the concept of omniscience. For example, is knowing the future part of omniscience? Does being omniscient mean you have to know the outcome of every scenario, every situation? Because it sure seems like there are some situations that happen in Star Trek that the Q aren't aware of what the outcome is going to be, even though they have this fourth dimensional perspective on on space-time. You could say that the future doesn't exist yet, that only the present exists, so there's nothing to know about the future yet because it hasn't happened. But that seems to contradict the Q's ability to pop in and out of space-time, being able to pop in and out of different different points in space-time whenever they want. And yet it sure seems like the Q don't know the outcome of some events, at least. If you define omniscience in the same way that we define it in theological circles, then absolutely a, a truth of omniscience is a knowledge that transcends time. I think you're absolutely right. There does seem to be a disconnect between what the Q know as true and what the future holds. There's definitely a disconnect. Because after all, let's face it. Let's let's go back to the episode Death Wish. If the Q were omniscient, then the whole purpose of a hearing to determine whether or not Quinn could have the right to commit suicide would be a moot point. 
Get because jump right they to the would end. have known. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They would have known that the end result would have been Quinn committing suicide. But that knowledge didn't exist within the continuum. They they didn't know the end outcome. Uh, therefore, I think that we can debunk this idea that Q is omniscient. I, I think had omniscience been a true attribute of the Q continuum, then the knowledge that Quinn was going to commit suicide would have would have been present. But I think you have the same problem in Christian theology. Can't you say just as easily that God knows the outcome of every human choice, even though he gave people free will? Why did he create a universe in which the fall of man was going to happen if he knew that was going to happen in advance? Um, I think in Christian theology, the emphasis tends to be on emphasizing the free will aspect of those things, not knowing what the outcome is going to be versus being aware of what the outcome is going to be. And you're right. And there is a tension that exists in Christian theology between the concept of free will and election and in terms of, of those who ultimately receive redemptive grace. One way of thinking of it is that God gave everybody free will to choose or to reject uh, the redemption of the cross in Christ. The other way of looking at that is that God predestined, predetermined those who would receive uh, the redemption of the cross in Christ. And so the question has to be raised for those who believe in predestination, then what is the purpose of the offer of redemption to all? Well, I think if you're of the camp that believes that there's a predestination element to things like salvation and Christian theology, you're going to emphasize God's omniscience, but de-emphasize free will, that Mm -hmm. choices are pseudo-choices in some way. They're not genuine choices. If you tend to err on the side of free will and think that, you know, we have some choice in the matter to follow or not follow, you're going to de-emphasize God's omniscience in some way. It seems weird to say that an omniscient being like God doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. So there's there's an, an inherent tension there. What does that mean for the Q continuum? I'm not really sure. It, it sure seems like there are some things that Q isn't aware of in terms of what the outcome of some situations are going to be. I'm thinking of the episode Deja Q, when Q is stripped of his Q powers. He's not omnipotent anymore. But he sure claims to be omniscient still. He says that all of the knowledge is still locked inside of this this tiny human brain, right? So he's claiming to have omniscience from what I gather. And yet he doesn't seem to know what's going to happen with this moon. He doesn't seem to care about what's going to happen with the moon. He's like, what is this moon you're blabbering on about, (laughs) Riker? (laughs) And he doesn't seem to know. It's almost like he has selective attention. Like he probably does know, but he's never thought about it and doesn't really care. It doesn't matter to him. So he's never thought about it before, even though in principle he could know what's going to happen to the moon. Are do the Q just have omniscience deficit disorder? <laughs> ODD, <laughs> ODD. <laughs> well, the Q s- certainly doesn't seem to know that he's going to make it out of this jam. He's he's pretty stressed out in the entire episode about being confined in this human form, and he does a lot of whining in the episode. So, again, I, I think there's a strong case to be made here that omniscience is not an attribute of the Q. We seem to be coming up with a few counterexamples pretty easily. Yes. Even though there are a lot of things they do know. They have all the mathematical knowledge. They have a lot of factual knowledge, historical knowledge, but not everything, it seems. They don't seem to be able to read Captain Picard's mind. They don't seem to be able to predict the future in all cases. Right. So they're pseudo-omniscient. So the one omni that the Q don't seem to have in any abundance is omni-benevolence. Q in particular doesn't seem to have omnibenevolence. Some of the other cues seem a little more compassionate, a little more omnibenevolent. Omnibenevolence is deeply tied up with the problem of evil in Christian theology, right? If God mm-hmm. is omnibenevolent, why do bad things happen? Why right. why does he let people do bad things? Why does he let disasters happen? Um, why is there suffering in the world? And there are interesting theological answers to those questions. And I think you can ask the same questions of the Q. If the Q are omnipotent and omniscient, and if they were omnibenevolent, 
why aren't they the universe's good Samaritans? Why don't they go about solving as many problems and doing as many good things and preventing disasters and preventing as much suffering as possible, given that they're omnipotent, if they were genuinely omnibenevolent? Omnibenevolence is certainly one, but there are actually a lot of attributes that we attribute to the Judeo-Christian God in theology that I don't believe can be said of the Q continuum. And tied to omnibenevolence is the idea of righteousness. We say that God is righteous. Uh, Righteousness refers to God's holiness, to his justice, to his salvific activity. Holiness, as I said, is tied to that. I, I certainly don't think that we can attribute holiness to the Q continuum. Uh, in fact, I think the opposite can sometimes uh, be true. They are uh, completely unholy. Immutability. Holier than now, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Immutability uh, is an attribute that we uh, we ascribe to God. Immutability means that God can't change. Graciousness uh, is one of the key tenets of of God's character. It's it's one of the core principles of Christianity to be uh, to be gracious. Um, well, I don't think anyone would say that the Q are omnibenevolent. It's an interesting question. Why aren't they omnibenevolent if they if they're all knowing and all powerful? Why aren't they more omnibenevolent? Why do they seem to lack that particular omni compared to the others? Yeah, they they don't seem to be omnibenevolent at all. And it, it, again, I think in truth. I think the opposite can be said. But I don't think that's necessarily true either, because it doesn't seem that their intention is necessarily evil. I I think to some degree the Q continuum possess a high mindedness that in their in their own thinking they are so far above. They they lack the, the humility that we see represented in the Christian Trinity through the person of Jesus. It is said in the Christian Bible of Jesus that, that he was God, is God, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself uh, to you know, to to the cross, he humbled himself to death, and so we see this characteristic in the triune God manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. This idea of humility and the Q continuum completely lacks humility. They are they are uh, well. So, they do they do take on human form, but they don't seem to do it humbly. <laughs> they do not do it humbly, and and, and I think that. What it what has become of them is that they are so high minded, they are so lacking in humility that they see the universe and humanity and for that matter every living being, every every planet, every star. It's a plaything. This is their sandbox. Well, okay. If the Q aren't omnibenevolent and they lack that humility, do they have moral obligations that they don't live up to? You know. I think you can plausibly say that they should have some moral obligations. They should be the universe's good Samaritans, given their omnipotence. You could say the same thing about God, though, in, from, in Judeo-Christian theology. Why, why doesn't God go around solving more problems and preventing disasters if he's, um, you know? The, I mean, you're the theologian of the two of us. You know, <laughs> g- Give me the answer, Mike. Why, why does God let bad things happen? That's the $64,000 question, isn't it? And I think you could say the same thing about the Q, right? Don't the Q have moral obligations to do all of those things if they're genuinely omnipotent and they know better because they're omniscient? It's important to recognize that there are genuine theological answers to these questions. And yet at the same time, I think there's a vulgar way of putting this and a more sophisticated way of putting this. The vulgar way of putting this is that this is a theological cop-out. <laughs> the, the more sophisticated way of putting this is that the theological answers are dissatisfying in some way. Surely the world would be a little better if the Holocaust didn't happen. Surely it would be a little better if young children didn't die in car accidents, right? And surely the brokenness of the world in in Christian theology uh, 
doesn't undermine God's omnipotence. He certainly has the, the ability to do those things, right? So I guess I don't see that the answers are very satisfying when it comes they're, down they're to They're not very tax. satisfying, Zachary, and I, I, think that's, uh, I, I think that's a fair criticism. Um, but the reality is, as Spock so eloquently put it, Edith Keeler must die. <laughs> so, so, sometimes, sometimes those bad things actually result in in something good. It points back to the redemptive nature of God, who is able to work all things together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. And that's that. And, and that may seem like a theological cop out, but uh, again, I I think the I think the answers are much much deeper. Well, then we could probably get into. No, this this is important stuff to talk about because I think theologically even it's important to get God off the hook for causing bad things, right? You don't want to say God causes bad things. So Certainly you need not. To, so you need to give some analysis of causation that gets God off the hook for causing Absolutely. bad things to happen. You could appeal to free will. You could say that God mm-hmm. doesn't cause bad things to happen. It's the humans that cause bad things to happen. Humans are the <laughs> ones that make bad choices and commit murders and do all the bad things, right? Sometimes they do. You could say that God doesn't cause bad things to happen. It's the devil or Satan that causes bad things to happen. You could say... And, and, the, and the joke is, the devil made me do it. But in reality, it is there's so much more to it than that. If, if, you, if you do subscribe to Christian theology, then you subscribe to the idea that there is a very real evil present in the world. You could also claim that there is no evil, that the things that seem Mm -hmm. evil or seem bad serve some higher purpose, that they're actually good. Um, I think there's something particularly dissatisfying about that answer. But it's the answer that Thomas Aquinas gave. Mm -hmm. He said there was no evil. There's just different degrees of goodness. And God is the supreme degree of goodness and everything else is just less good, not not evil in any substantive sense. and there are a few other options, but I think the, you know, the important thing there is to get God off the hook. You don't want to say that God is capricious and going around causing bad things to happen. Fundamentally, if God is the creator of everything, God created a universe in which those things happen. So, you know, he's not off the hook as the creator of the universe. Even <laughs> I, think, I think fundamentally, no matter how far you push things back, no matter what other explanation you give for the nature of, 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 of actions being good versus evil, God created everything in Christian theology. So he's, not, he's still on the hook for that. Um, what does this mean for the Q? Um, are the Q off the hook for the bad things that happen because they didn't cause them to happen in the way that God doesn't cause bad things to happen here in the physical universe? I th- what I find interesting, Zachary, is that for Gene Roddenberry, who was raised a Baptist, but in adulthood distanced himself from his religious roots and lived his adult life as a professing atheist. I, I find it fascinating that, first of all, that he would give us a character like Trelane in Squire of Gothos, but then to, in many ways, reintroduce Trelane to the next generation is this character Q. That's not my analysis. That's That's writers who <laughs> couldn't believe that uh, Roddenberry was bringing Trelane back, and Roddenberry assured everyone who was on the production team that he had. Don't worry, guys, I've got this. I'm. This is going to be fun, and he certainly was right. And we we get a we get a fun character who, interestingly enough, explores all that is both satisfying and dissatisfying when we think of a deity in the universe. Well, without question, the original series and Gene Roddenberry were obsessed with the notion of false gods. There are so many of them in the original series and they culminate in the, in, in the idea of the Q continuum. You know, I think the Q are kind of the logical um, extension of, of this notion of a false God. They have a lot of godlike qualities. They're omniscient. They're omnipotent. They might or might not be omnipresent. They are definitely transcendent. They might or might not be imminent. They may or may not be immortal. Mm-hmm. But they sure seem to lack the moral quality. <laughs> they're not omnibenevolent. Right. And I think, I think this is a subtle critique of religion in general, that any notion of a God 
in again from the perspective of Gene Roddenberry, from the perspective of the Star Trek universe, tends to have this moral failing. I think this is one of the critiques of religion. Well, if God is so great, why do bad things happen? Mm -hmm. I think you could plausibly say that the Q are a straight up criticism of those dissatisfying theological answers to the problem of evil. And yet we have an episode like Tapestry, which we consider a Q episode, where we explore the reality that sometimes those things in our life and our past in the world that are regrettable serve a higher purpose, serve a much higher purpose. I I find that interesting in a universe that is critical of, uh, of deity. Well, it sounds like Leibniz's answer to this problem is claiming that we live in the best of all possible universes, right? That it's not a perfect universe (laughs) because only God is perfect, but we live in the best of all possible imperfect universes. There's again, there's something just radically. Uh, I keep saying dissatisfying, but it is dissatisfying, right? Surely the universe would be a little better if some of these disasters didn't happen. Surely it would be a little better if innocent people weren't hurt as much as they are, right? That's not a very convincing answer. It, it might be a logical answer, but it doesn't. It doesn't ring true, does it? <laughs> um, so I, I guess you know fundamentally, you know, the Q are not off the hook morally, you know. In parentheses, maybe God is or isn't off the hook morally in in Judeo-Christian theology, but certainly the Q seem to be a criticism of this notion of an of an omnipotent being and the and the obligations that an, an omnipotent being should have and the type of character the the either the emotional character or the moral character that that a genuinely omnipotent being should have. You look around the world and you go, wait a minute, why do all, why are all these bad things happening? Where is Q? Where is God? <laughs> and, and perhaps um, in some ways. Q is is a criticism for the abuse of power. You know, Zachary, perhaps perhaps the writers are saying to us here within the Star Trek universe that, you know, these beings that seem to have omniscience, seem to have omnipotence, seem to have omnipresence, seem to seem to possess transcendence, uh, perhaps they abuse their power. And perhaps that's even a criticism that someone from a perspective of atheism would ascribe to the idea of a deity. Well, gee, it seem, sure seems like if there's a god out there that he's abusing his power when tsunamis happen and earthquakes happen and, and so on and so forth. In the New Testament, it talks about creation groaning, you know, groaning for its own redemption. It's crying out for its own redemption, uh, looking forward to, you know, that that point in the future in which God will will make all things new. Um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We do. We 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 live in a broken universe, and it, certainly, I think it begs the question: Well, then, why doesn't God just fix it? What you're describing, Mike, reminds me of what's known as perfect being theology, the notion that God is a perfect being and that everything else other than God, all the created things, are imperfect beings Mm -hmm. in some way. Um, The philosopher and theologian St. Anselm defined God as the most perfect being, the ens perfectissimum in, in Latin. So if by definition everything else is imperfect... It should be no problem to understand why there are bad things that happen, why there are disasters. You know, this is not a perfect world. God is a perfect being, but we live in an imperfect world, right? Only God is a perfect being. So I'm just wondering if that kind of perfect being theology is helpful in Christian theology. And is it helpful for the Q continuum? Are the Q perfect? Should we think of them as the most perfect being? Just like in in Christian theology, perfect being theology thinks of God as the most perfect being. We talk about the impeccability of God. The impeccability of God is closely related to God's holiness. It means literally that God is unable to sin. And he's a sharp dresser. (laughs) And he's a sharp dresser. (laughs) (laughs) To say that God is unable to sin is a much stronger statement than merely saying that God does not sin. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible for God to lie. So that's 
that's pretty impeccable. That's <laughs> I'm not talking I, I about can, the way he's dressed. That's I can can't you picture Q kind of giving the George Washington speech? I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> I mean, I mean, wouldn't you sure, agree Q. that that is probably the most characteristic way for me to describe the impeccability of God? For me to say that God is unable to sin. I guess my fundamental question is. Does the difference between a perfect being and an imperfect being, God is a perfect being, in parentheses, maybe Q is a perfect being, although I'm not really buying that whatsoever. I'm not buying that and, at all. <laughs> and everything and everything else in the universe being, by definition, imperfect, right? Because it's not God, it's created by God, but it's imperfect because only God is perfect. If that, if that distinction is useful, does that explain the nature of the world we see around us? Does that explain the disasters? Does that, does that explain the bad choices that people make? Does that explain all the bad consequences we see in the mm-hmm. world around us? Or is that a dissatisfying answer? Does it not explain those things to the degree that they need to be explained? My intuition is that it doesn't really explain why the universe is as bad as it is sometimes. <laughs> it might explain why there's bad things in principle, but it doesn't explain why it has to be this bad. Zachary, I liken that to asking the question, and and we can we can put anybody into the role that we want to, but just... Take, for instance, somebody who has made terrible choices in their life, and you can do something as simple as, uh, you know, somebody who's made some bad financial decisions and finds themselves homeless, or someone who perhaps has made bad moral decisions and committed, you know, genocide. Uh, you can go anywhere in that spectrum that you want to. That's a very broad spectrum, I realize. But you can go anywhere in that that you want to. Then ask the question, does that necessarily mean that that person had imperfect parents, bad parents? Is that a result? We're asking the question, you know, is the brokenness of the world a result of an imperfect God? Or is it possible for a perfect God to rule over an imperfect world? I actually think about it a little differently. I would even go so far as to grant the assumption that God is a perfect being, Mm -hmm. not trying to, not trying to undermine that idea in any way, shape or form and ask if, if that's true, if God is a perfect being and the world is imperfect in some way, does that explain the things we see around us in the world? Even granting the assumption that God is, is perfect, not trying to undermine that at all. You you could, you could try to undermine that. You could say, look, bad things happen. So God can't be perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's exactly what my question is. I think my question was a little more, let's grant all of that. Let's grant the distinction between perfect and imperfect. Why does the universe have to be as bad as it is? <laughs> I think that's a slightly different question. Um, again, I, I keep wanting to bring it back to Star Trek because this is a Star Trek and philosophy podcast. It doesn't make sense at all to call the Q perfect. They're lacking that moral quality that we normally associate Without with a doubt. Christian theology, right? It just doesn't seem... So maybe the question just doesn't apply. But it seems like they certainly should have some moral obligation. Um, you know, they have the omnipotence and the omniscience to know what to do. So why don't they, why aren't they a bit more omnibenevolent? Why aren't they a bit more helpful? Why aren't they nicer neighbors? And occasionally Q proves himself to be, but he does occasionally. occasionally out of character. Yes. I, I would, I would <laughs> characterize that as being out of character. Uh, very out of, speaking of character, I, I, I've always found it interesting within the realm of Star Trek, how many ways Q manifests himself the characters that he takes on uh we see him as a as a sea captain we see him as a marine we see him as a 21st century uh soldier we see him as a judge we see him as a three-headed snake uh we see him take on uh data's appearance we see him uh dressed up like friar tuck we see him as an admiral we see him as a french marshal we see oh, him as a starfleet her. commander a bajoran uh waiter we see him as an alien captain uh, this this Q's is just a, a cosplayer <laughs> this is a man of many faces <laughs> who knew q was such a theater geek <laughs> He is definitely uh definitely all about the theater that's for sure. <laughs> well Mike the last thing I wanted to talk about are the visual representations we see of the Q continuum in Star Trek. 
We see the Q continuum presented in a, in a number of different ways. We see the kind of Route 66 interpretation of the Q continuum, all these bored Q, you know, barely moving, going, you know, half asleep, no no movement out in the desert. We see the Civil War Q continuum. Mm-hmm. We see the white light Q continuum. Mm-hmm. What do you think the purpose is of these wildly different visual presentations of the Q continuum? I suspect that it has something to do with this problem in in theology of imperfect, finite beings like us that aren't omniscient and aren't all-knowing, not perfect, not having that infinite understanding, trying to comprehend these radically supreme qualities, omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence and omnibenevolence and such. There's a sense in which we can't fully understand those concepts because we have no basis for comparison. You know, that's not the world we live in. We don't have any of those qualities, right? And yet we still we still seem to reason about them. We still seem to talk about them. We um, have some logical understanding of them, even if we have no experience of them. There's There's a rich tradition of using metaphor to increase understanding of these concepts. You can give metaphors about the nature of the Trinity in Christian theology. You can give metaphors. We've given a ton of metaphors about the nature of good versus evil. Mm -hmm. Metaphors seem helpful in understanding the truth of those concepts. And I think Q says as much. He says, you know, I've created something that your finite minds can understand. (laughs) Is this the only way that, that we puny humans can understand the Q continuum to think of it in terms of Route 66 or the Civil War or a, a bright white light? We seem to have some abstract understanding of concepts like omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence, Mm -hmm. right? We can talk about them. We don't have to put ourselves in this metaphorical, you know, holodeck land in order to, in order to, to reason about those concepts, even if we have no direct experience of them. So given that, why does Q need to present the Q continuum in those ways? Can't he just say, you're in the Q continuum and we're all omnipotent. Don't you get it? (laughs) (laughs) Why, why all the metaphors? Well, I'm I'm glad you brought this up, Zachary. In theology, we talk about the incomprehensibility of God. Uh, I believe that there's a philosophical term, a catalepsy. It is the impossibility of comprehending or conceiving something. And I think that this has been the condition of mankind for the entirety of human history. The idea that God is incomprehensible means that he's not able to be fully known. His understanding is something that Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament said, no one can fathom. Uh, That God is so big, so infinite, so far beyond human comprehension. And yet, we humans have always had a way of trying to take the heavenly and bring it into our earthly realm. And so throughout time, we have tried to present God in different ways. For instance, in the Old Testament, uh, God was represented in a tent of sorts called a tabernacle. And because the Hebrew people were nomads for much of uh, the early days of their history. They literally took their church on their back. It was a it was a tent, and that tent was a physical representation. It was a house for God, but interestingly enough, the way in which it was constructed and the materials that were used and the way it was designed and laid out, none of it was by accident. Every every fiber of, of this tabernacle was intentional to represent God in different ways. And so we've taken that and throughout human history, we've seen that God has, uh, God has, has moved from something like an, a tent to a brick and mortar style temple. And that temple it, in many ways foreshadows the physical manifestation of God in Christ uh, in the New Testament. And, you know, even now in our art and in our churches, and we we see uh, mankind trying to make sense of the incomprehensibility of God and put it 
put him into a form and fashion that we can understand. So this is interesting. It sounds like you're saying that while we can have a pretty robust philosophical understanding of some of God's attributes, we can understand omnipotence, we can understand omniscience, we can understand omnibenevolence, we can understand immortality. Pick your favorite. We can't have a full understanding of God's full being in some way, except through metaphor, except through story, right. except through visual representations. And the same may be true of the Q continuum. We can talk about Q's omnipotence pretty easily. We nodded our heads at that one. Yeah, Q's omnipotent. We got that. We can talk about Q's omniscience. Sure. We, okay, we understand that, except there are some things he doesn't know. We can talk about the omnipresence of the Q. We can talk about their transcendence. Mm -hmm. But can we have a full understanding of their nature, given our finite understanding? Is there an catalepsy of the Q? It sounds like there is. And insofar as those things can only be understood, the, the fullness of the Q continuum, right? The, the, the nature of their being that we can't understand because we don't have those qualities. That fullness could only be represented visually or metaphorically or, or fill in the blank. And hence the need for all the metaphors that we see in, in the visual representation of the Q continuum. I think that makes perfect sense. It certainly squares up with, with how it works in theology. I can certainly hear Q say to Jean-Luc Picard, your pathetically small mind can't comprehend it, Jean-Luc. <laughs> Absolutely. I, insofar as God, and, and Louis Burkhoff, uh, the theologian, uh, said, insofar as God reveals himself in his attributes, we also have some knowledge of his divine being. It's still subject to our own human limitations. Plus, the Civil War representation gives Q a chance to wear another costume. <laughs> And we know Q's big on costumes. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, uh, Susie Plaxon, she pulls off the uh, Southern Belle quite well. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, it's been fun talking about the moral failings of the Q today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek.fm. Previously on Trek.fm, Literary Treks. I agree, though. It's fun to say, hey, I know who these characters are. I've seen them before, and now they're all together. That is cool. But at the same time, mm, how realistic <laughs> is it that they would all know Worf at some point or another? Well, it's just further evidence of my thesis that Star Trek is the story of Worf. This is what I've always said. <laughs> Worf is the central character in everybody's lives in Star Trek. <laughs> The 602 Club. And what was, in some ways, I think, poignant for where we are today, you know, the word Nazi gets thrown a lot, around a lot. But I think the beauty of who Juliana is is that she sees past even the word Nazi. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really important. I, I think that that is, the, I mean, we need more messages like that. The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. Okay, next year that's my goal. I will be. Yeah. I will carry the Haley <laughs> well, mojo. You'll, you'll have the head. Me. So <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm acting in behalf of Haley. Give me a hug. Yes. <laughs> as long exactly. As, you don't, as long as you don't tackle them on the way to the staircase, I think it's okay. To the journey. So they don't call it a Navy. They call it the Federation Naval Patrol. But same difference. It's basically a Navy. But what is its reason for being? To me, it sounds like they just renamed the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard is no longer, and now it's just the Federation Naval Patrol. But I'm guessing for, like, people that go out pleasure sailing and get stuck, the Federation Naval Patrol is there to help. They rescue like the tourists Guard. on Ryza who are drowning? Exactly. They just rescue people. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on your iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and most third-party podcast apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link as well.
Well, we would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode of Metatrex, and there are many ways for you to mind meld with us. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the contact form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Just choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select Metatrex. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Well, speaking of contact information, Mike, when you're not busy playing a capricious game of interplanetary squash with the universe, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Well, Zachary, you can always catch me on Facebook. That's where I'm most active. I'm also on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at cmichael1701, as well as Instagram, cmichael1701. And Zachary, when you're not dodging muskets in the Q Civil War, where can our listeners find you around the network and on the interwebs? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of To The Journey, Trek FM show dedicated to all things Star Trek Voyager. You can always find me in the Babel Conference or our listeners group on Facebook if you'd like to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me in there. And you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. Well, if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, we invite you to become a patron of the network on Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and many more, all available through our special patrons website, The Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of time and money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from around the network. Specifically, we'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, and the least capricious person I know. (laughs) Our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp. Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Che Mutala, our Patreon manager. And a special thank you and a shout out to our four associate producers here on Metatrex. We'd like to thank Patrick Devlin. You can find Patrick under the Twitter handle at MagicDrop5. Kay Shaw, my former co-host on To The Journey. You can find her on Twitter at Chaco Weeble. Norman Lau at Starfighter1701. And Mark Walker at Mark74656. Nice number there, Mark. Voyager fans approve. Well, Mike, we'd like to once more invite our listeners to discover more about our sponsor, Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. And check out audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek and philosophy podcast. Until next time, we will once again boldly go where no philosophers have gone before. Metatrex.